our scriptures today for this new sermon series we're starting called God at the Movies. And you can see in, the, in your bulletin there, we're going to have a series of different movies uh, each week to talk about and how we can see God in the movies. Our first one is Chariots of Fire. And for that uh, message, I've chosen Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 3, 8 to 10, and 11, the first and fourth commandments, and Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. From Exodus chapter 20, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. And therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. May the Lord bless the reading of his words. Gracious Father, speak to us today, I pray, that uh, uh, as we talk about taking a stand for you, Lord, uh, help us to see in what ways you might be calling us to, to stand for you, uh, whether it's at home or at work or whatever it might be. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will... Show us ways that uh, we are not seeking you first, maybe, that we should be. And, uh, and as we encounter your spirit through today's uh, scriptures and songs and stuff, Lord, we just pray that uh, you will transform us and, and make us into the image of your son so that we could be the people you called us to be and that we'll be pleasing in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for me, summertime is the time when I like to go to the movies a lot. Uh, there's a lot of blockbusters that come out. Most of the blockbusters are released at this time, uh, it seems like. And with this message, we're going to begin a series of sermons that look at how God has been seen at work in the medium of modern motion pictures. I specifically avoided the use of Christian movies uh, that were produced with a Christian message in mind and have chosen popular secular films in which God's nature or glory was revealed, I think. And ironically, I never had seen Chariots of Fire I just knew about it until this week. I watched it. Our first movie is a 1981 British film, Chariots of Fire, which tells the fact-based story of two athletes in the 1924 Paris Olympics. Eric Little, a devout Scottish Christian who ran for the glory of God, and Harold Abrahams, an English Jew who ran, for the, ran to overcome prejudice in that time. Chariots of Fire was nominated for seven Academy Awards and won four, including Best Picture and Best Original Score, and we just sang along with the Best Original Score just a moment ago. I chose this movie to kick off our sermon series because it begins where I think all of us must begin in our spiritual journey, and that is with taking a stand for Jesus. When, uh, when uh, Reagan professed faith in Jesus Christ recently, I shared that with the folks, uh, Carrie's granddaughter at uh, horse camp recently, and uh, then just today, uh, Lila was sharing Jane uh, Edson taking a stand for Jesus at her Bible school. Uh, that's, that's where it all starts. There's some, some point where you decide, yes, I, I want to stand for him. And so that's where we're starting this sermon series with this movie, because I think this is a movie that really illustrates well taking a stand for Jesus. One of the uh, main point purposes of the scriptures and the songs and stuff today was to drive home the importance of giving God the proper place in our lives. And one of the main themes of Chariots of Fire was the Christian faith of Eric Little, a Scottish son of missionaries in China. Eric was involved in ministry as well, but he'd come back for schooling. And while he was here, it, it turned out that Eric was so fast that in one race, and this is really true, uh, and this is a true story, by the way, uh, based on a true story. They did some normal embellishments. You can read all about them on Wikipedia. But he was actually knocked down in a race and got up and ran and won the race after being knocked out by a poor sports person pushing him to knock him down. Uh, so he's very fast. But he was also a strong Christian as well. And his sister Jenny was preparing to return on a mission trip to, back to their mission work in China and she was upset that Eric was preparing for the 1924 Olympics, thinking that maybe his, his priorities were not what they should be. So in this clip from Chariots of Fire, his sister shows her resistance to his running in this scene. He's late. 
training, training, training. All I have here is training. Do you believe in what we're doing here or not? Look, Jenny, I'm sorry. I was late. I apologize. That's all very well, Eric. Look, I said I was sorry. To me, it's not me you've insulted. Oh, where we have fought that? The law will not feel slighted in the missing of a bus. Yes, Eric, you missed a bus, but why? Your mind's not with us anymore, son. It's full of running and starting and medals and pace. Your head's so full of running, no room for standing still. Decided. I'm going back to China. The missionary service have accepted. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm so pleased. Well, I've got a lot of running to do first. Jenny. Jenny, you've got to understand. I believe that God made me for a purpose. For China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give it up would be to hold him in contempt. You were right. It's not just fun. To win is to honor him. I think Eric probably would have considered that scripture that says, and whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. And, uh, I think he's, he lived that lot in his life, and he did it in his running as well. But his faith is going to be tested even further when he is, dis he is to discover that his event that he's going to compete in, the 100-meter race, had a qualifying heat on Sunday. And he had been preaching to young kids about how you shouldn't be playing football and things on, on the Sabbath. You should, you know, f focus on the Lord. And now he was going to be challenged to do this, uh, and he will have to go up against members of the com Olympic Committee from his country as well as his own prince, the Prince of Wales, is going to be putting pressure on him in this scene I call honoring the Sabbath. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Little, what do you think your chances against Abraham's? I'll do my best. Could do no less, right? Mr. Little, sir, uh, what about the qualifying heats on Sunday? What did you say? On Sunday, do you think you can beat the Americans? When did you get to know? Did you not read the papers this morning? I had the whole program. The heats for the Honda are on the Sunday after the opening ceremony, the Samuels and final a couple of days after. It's only a heat. Does it make all that difference? only one way to resolve the situation. That's for this man to change his mind and run. Don't state the obvious, Cadogan. We have to explore ways in which we can help this young man to reach that decision. I'm afraid there are no ways, sir. I won't run on the Sabbath, and that's final. I intended to confirm this with Lord Birkin tonight, even before you called me up in front of this inquisition of yours. Don't be impertinent, little. The impertinence lies, sir, with those who seek to influence a man to deny his beliefs. Our country, little, we're appealing to your beliefs. In your country, in your king. Your loyalty to them. Yeah, yeah. In my day, it was king first, God after. Yes, and the war to end wars bitterly proved your point. God made countries. God makes kings and the rules by which they govern. And those rules say that the Sabbath is his. And I, for one, intend to keep it that way. Well, when a famous runner like Eric Little is willing to give up his chance to compete in the Olympics, something he's maybe trained for all, most of his life, out of respect for God, then it makes international news. And this was in papers all over the world. Some were critical of his decision, others respected him for it, but in the end, the solution to the problem was that Eric did not compete in the 100 meter race, which was his forte. He decided they, they made the switch and put him in the 400 meter race, which most people think uh, he didn't have a chance to win. Good luck, 
Watch out for little. Coach says no problem. He's got something to prove, something personal. Something guys like Coach will never understand in a million years. Says in the old book, he that honors me, I will honor. Good luck, Jackson Shows. Although the movie showed that uh, this message of encouragement given to Eric Little was from the American runner Jackson Shoals. Uh, by the way, Jackson Shoals ran for the University of Missouri in Columbia and uh, at one time was considered one of the fastest men in the world. I think he tied the world record. This note was actually given to him by his teammates, which still showed a support that was not always there when they said, God honors those who honor him. And for a spoiler alert, if you are going to watch the movie, there's other storylines with Mr. Abrahams I'm not going into, but for a spoiler alert, so shut your ears if you don't want to, if you ever want to, it's like the 1981 movie and you still haven't got around to watching it and it's on your bucket list, close your ears because he ran in the 400 meter race and he won the gold medal in it. I find this movie inspiring. Perhaps, perhaps because I long for men and women like Eric Little who will take a stand for Jesus and make him the priority in their life and realize that when they do so, they're honoring him and, uh, and they're, they're winning for him. Uh, he, Jesus himself taught his disciples in Matthew 6, 38, uh, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given you as well. And, and he sought him first and he, he got the reward and also... He got the ability to share his message, which he wanted. Two of the top ten commandments God gave Moses on Mount Sinai taught a very similar lesson, and I shared those with you earlier. The first commandment, God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And then this, the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. I believe we need more people today who are willing to make their faith in Christ their top priority. And that's why I like the message of this movie so much. When I taught at Marshall High School, and, and I know I'm going to step on some toes today. Uh, when I taught at Marshall High School, especially during the early years, one of the general rules that we were given by the school administration was that we would have no activities scheduled on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, because those, or, or Sundays at all, because those were reserved for the church. As many of you can remember when uh, we had blue laws on Sundays in, in certain areas of the grocery store were roped off that we, we wouldn't sell all those things on Sunday. At a recent member a meeting of the Marshall Minister Alliance, one of the pastors suggested it might be time for us to send a formal letter to the school board and ask them again to, in this case, have a policy that says, please don't schedule activities on Sunday. It appears that from, the, from my colleagues at that meeting, it appears that most churches have experienced the problem of competing with school activities and losing young people and their families. And oftentimes it's kind of, it's nebulous because it's not a official school activity. It is a uh, extracurricular activity or it's an activity uh, not put on by the school, but your coach of your team says you need to do this or else you can't play on my team. You need to be in this summer league or this out-of-season league or you don't, you don't really care for your sport. And I see an athlete shaking her head. You know what that's about, don't you? You, know, you get that message very loud and clear. If you want to play on my team, you're going to be in that, in that summer league or that out-of-season league that's going to play on Sunday oftentimes. A recent cover story for Christianity Today's Pastors Magazine titled, When Church Gets Sidelined, dealt with the rise of youth sports leagues and the fact that many games are held on Sundays and require families to choose between the pews or the bleachers. A survey of 246 church leaders found 86% reported that their church has struggled with families choosing sports over church. And I might also say people choose the lake over church and people choose a bunch of other stuff over church too. It's, it's, you know, I shouldn't be just talking about the one thing, but this movie was about sports. So... Um, 
But anyway, 86% say they've struggled with people choosing sports over church, and 59% said it was a major issue for their church. I confess uh, that this trend of sports leagues playing on Sundays has really irritated me sometimes. I have been told that in the city they have a shortage of places to play, so they have to start the game on 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, all the games so they can get them all in. I've been told that that's the reason for why they do that. But I'm sure some of you have also heard me vent my frustrations, and I'm embarrassed to admit, you know, I, I say these things. But I, I've been frustrated to the point sometimes that I have said, I believe there's a special place in hell for people who schedule youth events on Sunday morning. Well, the Bible says in Mark chapter 9, verse 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. <laughs> Amen. Okay, maybe I'm being too harsh. Maybe it's just about me being selfish because I truly feel that your church family needs you, and, and, and I truly miss you when you're not here. And maybe it's just because it hurts my ego, and I feel like I've somehow failed to impress upon you how vitally important I think this relationship to God is and in in your church is. So there, there may be other ulterior motives here, but one pastor at the, the Mar a recent Marshall Ministerial Alliance meeting said that he felt that many of his parishioners thought that participation in sports was going to result in hefty college, college scholarships for their, their children, and that's why they were doing it. And he proposed, you know, if they would take all the money that they spend on equipment and fees and travel and food and motels and put that into an account and start saving it, you know, when they're in like fourth grade, when they're starting all these events, by the time they get college age, he said, I think they'll have a hefty scholarship of their own. That might be an oversimplification, but I thought it was interesting that other people feel this frustration. Because the fact of the matter is, you know, I've been in Marshall High School, Al fan for many, many years, and I can count on like one hand how many have made a successful career in professional sports that were really good in high school. Kyle Rohan is the managing editor of Christianity Today's Pastor Magazine, reported in a 2013 study published in review of religious research found that competing Sunday activities, especially youth sports, was the biggest factor contributing to decline in church membership or church attendance. And readers reported that 32% of our churches lose 10 or more regular, att regular attendance to youth activities each service. Each of these, he says, represents a name and a face, a once committed person who weighed the options then chose to strike out church on their calendar. You want to unplug that little button on the side, on the little thing on the side there? Thank you. They chose to, to choose sports or soccer or something else instead of church. Now he goes on to say, make sure your actions in response to this issue come from a place of love and concern rather than pride and bitterness and jealousy. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm having to ask myself, why do I feel this way? I'm hoping it's love and concern. He goes on to point out that the church has faced challenges at every stage, from Roman persecution to internal division. He says, Jesus promised the gates of hell would not prevail against his church, and I'm pretty sure youth soccer won't either. I thought that was a, a, a humorous way of, of reassuring us. But they had other pastors weigh in on this issue, and a, a Reverend David Prince of Louisville, Kentucky, uh, contributed these ideas. He says, I, I asked my people to propose the following questions to yourself. While I play sports, how can I rightly acknowledge God as creator? Now, you heard uh, the, the clip. It might be kind of murky because I had to film it off my computer screen. But the, the clip where Eric Little says, for me, to win honors God. And, and so uh, in his case, he was a world-class athlete and and he had a stage because of that that allowed him to really honor God. Uh, most fourth graders don't have that stage or that ability that he had. While I play sports, so how can I rightly acknowledge God as creator? And how can I play sports in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And then he says, you can also put in, how can I work? How can I do my work in a way that acknowledges my creator? How can I do my work in a way that, that uh, acknowledges the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? How can I be a parent in a way that honors God and, 
and honors the Creator. How can you know, I do anything? You can put whatever other things you have that might be a distraction to you in there. He argues sports are rarely the problem. Inadequate leadership in the home is, and it just so happened this fell on Father's Day, you know. But he says the problem is sports are not a valid reason to reject God or to neglect, neglect God. He says parents are responsible for setting boundaries for their children's sports participation. And he says withdrawing from sports is not the answer and becoming enslaved to practice. And those of us who are parents, I can remember taking my daughter to dance lessons uh, three nights a week. It, it was like Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays. Every week we were going dance, 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 dance. And of course she is a professional dancer now, so that Oh, no, she's not, is she? Oh, okay. So we were running like crazy. And some of the parents, young parents in the room can probably relate to this. We run like crazy to try to keep, get all these activities in. And, and that's not a healthy thing either. So he says that we, need, we need to set boundaries. We need to, to set a boundary that says uh, whenever we go into a league, you know, we want you to know up front that if there's a Sunday morning game, our kids, we're going to go to church. That's what he says. Now, another church leader says, well, although it's easy to resent this trend, she says, chiding families to choose between church and sports won't work. They will almost always choose sports. And in many cases, they already have. She says, instead, the pastor should look for creative ways to meet this challenge. And she proposes that we live stream our worship so families on the go can watch it in, in the cars and, and in, at the bleachers where they are hanging out. Or provide take-and-go worship services that they can take some liturgy that they can read as they go. Or provide worship on another night of the week. Well, we're doing that one, you know, Tuesday nights. So we already got that one. Another person who contributed uh, from Palm Beach, Florida, confessed that she has dealt with this same issue as a parent. And then she has a son that he's really good at a sport. And so she says, now... I, I once believed Sunday services were non-negotiable, non but now I've reevaluated my priorities and considered non-negotiable uh, has been changed from weekly Sunday attendance to being actively involved in the body of Christ, which she describes as intentional home dis discipleship and discussion. But I'm really wondering how much, how active in the body of Christ are you if, you, if everything is home discipleship and discussion? It's tough. The world's busier and busier, and schedules are going to become more jam-packed, she says. Parents hope pastors will extend them grace in ways that coaches will not. And that's what we've done. Because we will not tell you you can't be on our team if you're not here. But coaches will. And so people don't come. I don't know the answer to this. I know that honoring the Sabbath is a tricky thing. It hit me in the face this morning. I wanted to go get a cupcake so I could put a candle in it and, and do that for my children's time today. But I would have had to go to Walmart on Sunday morning on a day that I'm talking about honoring the Sabbath and buy a cupcake. And I thought, no, I cannot do that. That just seems hypocrisy all over, doesn't it? In Jesus' time, the Pharisees carried the commandments to honor the Sabbath to extremes. I mean, uh, there was, if you broke your arm, they would not let you set that arm until the next day. You'd have to go the whole day with a broken arm because it was against, by setting the arm, you're breaking the Sabbath, they said. You're doing work. You could keep it from getting worse, but you couldn't make it better. That's what the Pharisees said. That's how they interpreted honoring the Sabbath. They said you can wear sandals as long as there's not nails holding the sandals together. If there's nails in the sole, you're carrying a weight when you walk, and you're bearing a burden, and that would be, you know, so you couldn't do that. They had all kinds of rules, and Jesus came along, and Jesus healed on the Sabbath, and they got mad at him. And so mad, in fact, that it says in the book of John, they wanted to kill him. And they sought to kill him from that point on because he was healing people on the Sabbath. And he told them, God gave the Sabbath to you because it's not, for him, it's not for God's sake, but it's for your sake that he gave you the Sabbath. He knows you need the Sabbath rest. So I'm not proposing that we return to some sort of pharisaical rule. But I do believe that every Christian must ask himself or herself, how do I assure that something else is not taking the place of God in my life? How do I assure that I'm truly seeking his kingdom first? 
and foremost? How do I guarantee that I have the time that I need for reflection and worship and rest? And that God knows that I need this, or he, that's why he gave it to me. And how do I honor God in the 21st century? So make this your prayer. Lord, show me how to honor you and take a stand for you today. I've, I've given you extremes on both sides, and, and I've confessed that I really sometimes wonder about my you know, possibly selfish reasons for wanting you here. But I want you here. I think well, we need you here. I would like to build a complex or two of sporting of things that, so they won't have shortage of scheduling up there in the city and people can go and start in the afternoon at least and not in the morning. But I want you to know that as you struggle with these issues, and I know the young parents uh, will, will do that, and, you know, do you let your kids go to work at Walmart when he's going to work on Sunday morning? He's going to be out of church from then on. Those are questions that we have to deal with. These pressures are not something new, though. In 1924, Eric Little had to deal with the same kind of pressures. He was being told by his prince that you should put country first. And he said no to me, and he'd made that choice himself. And somehow he found a way to honor God and use his God-given gifts at the same time to compete in the sport he loved. And he honored God with the way he used those gifts. And by the way, as a final footnote, I will tell you this. Eric Little did go back to China as a missionary, and he died serving Christ as a missionary in China in 1945. Was that worth it? I can only tell you this. China claimed Eric Little as their first Olympic athlete winner. Even though he's from Scotland. If you read China, he was born in China to, Chinese, to Scottish missionaries there, and he died in China, and they will claim him as theirs. Yes, Al, they will steal everything, like you said this morning. China, and so he apparently had an impact with the way he lived. And all I'm asking you to do is, is make those choices that you will choose to live a life that honors God Ask God to show you what that will be, uh, where to draw the line in your life. You know, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, these, these are tough things. We want to honor you, and we know that, Father, being a Pharisee about it and, and making up a bunch of rules that are about law and not grace are, are not the way to honor you. But at the same time, God, we know that so many people in our world today are, are making you an afterthought. And pretty soon, you're not thought of at all. How can we, Lord, show the world that we honor you, that you matter, that you matter to us, that, that we want to please you and, and serve you? Show us that way, Lord. Help us to honor you in the way we live, to honor no other gods before you, and to get that rest that we need in our spirit, that Sabbath that you provided for us for our benefit that we might restore ourselves and renew ourselves and reflect upon you to do this in remembrance of you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.